Okay. Hello there, folks, and welcome to Write the Docs podcast, episode 30. Um, I am Jared Morgan, your de facto host for the show. Uh, and uh, as usual, we are joined uh, for this episode by the usual suspects. First suspect, of course, is Tom. Hello there, Tom. Hey, Jared. Nice to see you again. That's right. It's been too long, hasn't it? <laughs> it has. It has. Yeah. It's been a while between uh, podcast drinks, but uh, we'll get back into the swing of it. And um, this is a good one to get us back into the swing as well, the topic we've got today. But more on that in a moment. Before we go launching in, we can't forget about our friend Chris Ward over in Berlin. Hello there, Chris. Hey. How you doing? Good. It's, I know it's very late for you over there. My apologies for scheduling this podcast so late for you. It's now Sunday. <laughs> Sunday. Look, you're in the same Just time Sunday. zone as me. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> It's very good. Well, look, thanks for joining us again as Newton as normal today. Um, and uh, now that we've got the usual suspects, I'd like to introduce our special guest for the show today. Um, welcome to the show, Tom and Chris, um, Juan Lara from Google. Hello there, Juan. Hey, hey guys. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's great to have you on. Thanks for joining us today um, on your Saturday over there in the US. Um, one, for folks who don't know you, um, you've, you're actually on the Write the Doc Slack, aren't you? Uh, a fair bit. Um, some people might know you from the Write the Doc Slack. Is that right? Oh, I don't think he can hear for some oh. reason. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I I'm back. Oh, okay. good. Excellent. Yeah, sorry. Juan, I was just, I was just, uh, busy on Slack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying, Juan, that um, uh, some folks might uh, recognize you from uh, Slack, the Write the Doc Slack. You seem to be on there a fair bit. Yeah, the Write the Doc Slack. I try to attend the Write the Doc San Francisco meetups as often as I can. Oh, great. Yes. Excellent. That's good. Now, um, how about... Um, for folks who may not know you as well, um, not being on Slack or for whatever reason, how about you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I got into technical writing because I was interested in writing and technology and tech writing for me was a perfect way to reconcile those interests. I've been a tech writer at Google for three years to the day on Friday. Well, happy anniversary. That's awesome. Thank you. That's really good. Well, look, uh, that's excellent. We're going to be talking a fair bit about um, technical writing, obviously, considering this is Write the Docs podcast. But um, today's episode is focusing on um, documentation templates and everything around and surrounding that sort of uh, idea in technical writing. So um, what we're going to talk about today is um, it's a whole range of subjects. We're going to talk about the value of templates, um, whether the... Um, like templates are good for brainstorming or whether they're good for like actually just getting people to fill in a cookie cutter style template. We're going to go into a pile of topics. So rather than list them all out, let's just go and dive on in and uh, talk about stuff. Tom, you might want to actually introduce a few points here because I know you had some good points to sort of uh, start the show off. So take it away. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would love to just introduce this topic a little bit and why I wanted to focus the show on this. Uh, at my work recently, uh, we have a manager, she's new, and she wants us to create this center of excellence uh, where like all these different teams who are publishing on our developer portal can go to the center of excellence and find best practices for what's expected of their documentation, templates for different documentation types, you know, a template for a getting started tutorial, a template for a reference or something, um, and find other just, you know, things they need to do uh, for different doc types. And I was thinking back to a discussion I had with Juan um, back at an event in San Francisco a while back. We were talking specifically about templates um, and the different like categories of templates that, that, that are available in different companies. Um, and then I saw that Google launched this technical writing course uh, geared mainly towards engineers, teaching them how to write and write docs. Um, although I didn't see the templates there, but I, uh, it did cover a lot. I haven't gone through in detail all of that, but I was kind of skimming through. You know, it covers a lot of uh, different instruction about how to write, um, how to write technical documentation. So I thought this would be a perfect topic because I hear this a lot. And Jared, I know you are in this, um, you're involved in a, 
in a group that's trying to make templates. Uh, that's right. So I'm sure you'll have a lot of input there. But that's kind of the gist of the re- why this topic I think is relevant because as we as we help other people contribute, we have to guide them, and the template is like the default way to guide people. So, mm. yeah. Um. Now, sorry. Uh, to kick things off, there's actually a, a link that I thought was pretty good. Um, f- uh, Google dot or sorry, cloud dot google dot com slash spanner slash docs, and it sort of had it. It has documentation broken out into seven different buckets quick start how to guides apis and reference concepts tutorials support and resources um and and this is going to tie into a much larger topic about how different uh different technical writing methodologies kind of uh put documentation into different topic types i'm sure you're familiar with did his concept, task, reference, troubleshooting, glossary. You know, people have been doing this for years. So, um, uh, Juan, tell me a little bit about templates. Like, do you find templates useful, or is this only a tool to help non-writers uh, get oriented? Uh, from the moment I started at Google, I found the templates they provided for us immensely useful. S- So you saw in that documentation page, these buckets of uh, document types, those match exactly to the templates we use to to write documentation. And it was immensely helpful for onboarding and learning the the style we used for our documentation. So so you kind of have in your team, you have like these templates more fleshed out. Like, can you just, I mean, I don't know if you, can describe them or what, but like, for example, quick start, is that a checkbox of different things to include or like what, uh, what might be a good template? Maybe, you know, if people want to make a quick start template. Is this something that is, is covered in a paragraph or do you just start with like fill in the blanks and placeholders? I don't, I don't even really know how to approach templates. We kind of have exactly documentation about how to write the documentation. Um, so we have, like you said, a template of what the document looks like, what the section should be. For example, before you begin, describe the prerequisites. And then the, the, our documentation or our template goes into the style for the page, how to write the headings, how to write the title. And it most interestingly, and, you, and what I found really useful is that it went into information about the document type and what kind of audience you should be writing for and what the type of audience means for how you write. Hmm. I've got it up on screen. Hopefully you folks can see it there. Um, Yeah. Scroll down a bit, uh, Jared. Can you scroll scroll down to show the, oh, you've clicked into the quick start one. Yeah. I actually want to back out. Yeah, back out to the the kind of the list of the different buckets. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so interesting. So different documentation types might have different audiences. Like, uh, for example, a conceptual overview might be something more oriented to a product manager or like a C-level exec versus a how-to targeted towards uh, like concept. Engineer. Uh, conceptual, I would say, in my understanding, is more geared to someone trying to build their expertise. Um, like it says right here, develop a uh, deeper understanding of the product. Hmm. Whereas a uh, how-to is someone that has one very specific task they're trying to do. In this case, it might be um, creating a new database instance or uploading a uh, some set of data to the database. I know that this gets into this larger question about information models for TechCom and Dita has kind of built its its whole philosophy around splitting content up into concepts, tasks, and reference. You know, here I'm looking at a bucket called concepts and how-to guides is like tasks and then APIs and reference. So there's very clearly like at least these three categories. Do you think that um, like it's a good practice to separate out 
concepts from tasks or do you mix these two formats uh, more fluidly? I'm just kind of curious what different people think about, uh, you know, separating content by type versus kind of mixing it all. I would say that for me, the thing that uh, information typing is one of the things that most improve my writing outside of learning grammar and learning about writing an active voice. Uh, the information typing taught me to think about the audience and different kind of learning needs that uh, a reader might have at different moments. So uh, how to in a how-to guide, someone's really focused on ac accomplishing one task they need to get their job done at the moment. Whereas a concept, they might, someone might have more time and patience to read through, especially a longer, more complicated document. And I mean, uh, I I can anticipate that there would be expectations from the audience, right? If you if you're in a concept topic you probably are, are prepared to sit through uh, long chunks of text without, without tasks, right? Diagrams and lengthy explanations. Whereas if um, you, know, you come to a quick start, your expectation is that you're gonna be doing something, it's not gonna take a long time and you're, you're gonna see some kind of result, right? Whereas if you're in a reference, you probably, uh, you don't bring expectations about like, getting grounded conceptually about how to like understand the reference, but rather just to consult parameters and different values and, you know, function names or whatever it is. Uh, I guess that's interesting to think that, you know, uh, putting content into different, different patterns, like maybe helps the audience, uh, I don't know, consume it better or just like interact more predictably with the different information types. Um, now, I, I like that we have this Cloud Spanner documentation as a sample, because uh, even though you've got the content organized by type, well, not you, I mean, I'm, I don't know who's the author of this, but like, even though the, this person has the, <laughs> <laughs> even though this person has organized content by type, there's another type of organization by, by topic. Um, so that, you know, when a user comes to docs, they're not necessarily, not necessarily thinking, mm, I want a concept or, Ooh, I want to, I want a how to guide. No, they're like, show me how to, uh, create a shipping label or something, or, or, you know, show me how to replicate my database, you know? And, and, and so uh, I'm wondering, do you think there's like a conflict between, uh, organizing docs by topic, which is probably, probably the natural inclination of a user versus kind of stamping them by types. This doesn't just have to be a question for Juan. This is like, you know, anybody, Chris or Jared. Uh, Do you have any thoughts about that one, Chris? Um, I've never really done the topic-based writing at all. Um, it's not a natural way for me to do it. I'm more likely to fall into this kind of path of organizing around areas. I've not ever really formally done templates in any jobs. I think mostly because I've always been working for companies where you've never really had the time to take a step mm -hmm. back and do that kind of stuff, even though maybe you should have. Um, I'm probably about to start a job soon where I might actually, um, and it might be interesting to, to look at some of this sort of structure. I think the, the thing where it's always hit me is those gray areas. Uh, like they're already... I look at how to guides and tutorials and it's the classic question of like, what's the difference and what goes where? And I think that's always the problem with templates when people, uh, it's not always, it's not always easy to stick things into a bucket <laughs> <laughs> and how do you decide where it goes and why? And is it just you arbitrarily deciding because you want it to fit into a bucket or does it really fit into a bucket? That kind of thing has always bothered me about following templates, but um, I do say that from a perspective of never really actively using them. So I don't, I may not necessarily know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's interesting <laughs> it's you say. Always struck me. Yeah. I know that what you're saying, I do understand where you're coming from with like, how do you fit the content into a template, particularly if there's uh, like a, a document type that doesn't really quite exist yet. 
and yeah. you, you kind of, you, you know, it should have some sort of form to it. So it makes it easier for people to consume the information, but working out what that looks like, particularly for a new document type is really hard mm. and often takes a fair bit of uh, like information architecture and decisions to actually get to the point where you have a template. And this is probably the, the biggest thing I've found with, with what I'm doing with the Good Docs project. Um, the Good Docs project is a, um, a project um, that helps, uh, it's, its aim is to help um, developers or anyone who needs to spin up a documentation set from scratch to use a set of, let's call them best practice. I know that's an, a loaded term, but um, for the benefits of this discussion, we'll call it best practice templates that help them quickly spin up the, the different types of documentation they might need for a project um, that's just starting out. And then from that point, iterate on them um, to the point where they're happy with a really good documentation set. So start off with good docs and then end up with great docs by iterating. So it took a while for us to work out when we were setting up the project, what, what the information type should be, what the, the actual template should have in them, whether we should go with the whole, you know, this almost strict data style of concept task reference and make it really rigid, or whether we should look a little bit wider and go, well, here's a sort of, rather than looking at the, the category of template, it's more about the goal the template's trying to do. Like, is it like a discussion? Is it like a, um, a how-to? Is it something that teaches you something or is it something that you use as you're starting to learn about a project? And we settled on the, the latter being the, the goal-based sort of templates that help you um, work out what you're trying to achieve um, with the project. So things like if you want to map them, the concept uh, template style is almost like a discussion template in our project because concepts can be a little bit fluid. I know that uh, it sounds like that's sort of what you were describing a little bit before, Chris, where you, you have some content, you know it's necessary to put into the document, but you don't quite know. It doesn't really fall into a category. It's a little bit conceptual. Yeah. It's a little so bit how to- multiple places. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's where like, you know, sometimes you can, you can sort of slot that into something more like a discussion style article, which sort of goes into some concepts um, more broadly and, and sort of like fills in the gray areas a little bit, um, mm. with the templates. So that's, that's the way we went, uh, in, in the project. But the thing is that I think over, overall, I think with templates, they've, they take a fair bit of research to get right because you've got to make mm. sure they're right for the audience that's using them. And if you can get that right and it takes time, that's when you'll find the templates become most useful. Is, is that a process that uh, you or the people who, I'm not sure if these cloud spanner document example is something you worked on, Juan, but let's say with whatever projects you've worked on, is that a process you went through first to, to figure that out and find the pathways people follow or was it more? So the templates um, I use were created before mm -hmm. I got there. But from what I understand, uh, there was an information architecture committee and that formed the templates. And now there's a team of editors that manage and update the templates. Okay. And the templates came out of the need to uh, improve our documentation quality and our consistency across all the different teams because mm -hmm. we have maybe around 100 writers now. Well, that's a how, how much um, How much flexibility do you have in that in terms of, you know, are the templates there as guidance only or starting point only? Can you, can you, you know, work them in slightly different directions if you want to? Can you feed back to that team and say, this isn't working anymore or it's actually causing us more hassle to work to this template? Yes. Uh, our, we have a great team of editors. I love working with them and they're very open to feedback and they definitely say this is a, a guidance and, if you really need to, you can change things up. But I think it's really important for us across our products to keep a, a consistent information architecture. Mm -hmm. Right. So we did. I did mention at the top of the show about how we use templates and, and what sort of utility they're for. So would you say, and this is an open question for anyone today, do you think templates 
are sort of used as a way to to figure out um, uh, a particular document um, IA before you start writing the content, like a scratch pad essentially. Or do you find that templates more take the form of like a, I guess a cookie cutter style um, document where really all the hard work's been done for you and then you just fill in the gaps essentially with perhaps a little bit of lenience either way around the, the document structure. What do you folks think about that? Well, I, I, I hope, okay, I don't really use templates that much either, but I think that I should use them more <laughs> because um, I think unconsciously when I start to write a how-to topic or some kind of task, I start off with high-level summary uh, then I include an on-page table of contents. And then usually I might ha have a prerequisite section. Maybe I'll have a like important terms section. And then I'll start off with like a task and kind of try to arrange the tasks uh, in, a, in a way that makes sense. Uh, sometimes they're sequential, but you know, it, sometimes when I read other people's writing and they're like, they don't have those sections or they have something totally different. It makes me suddenly aware of the templates that I'm following unconsciously in my head. And I think it might be, be good to kind of like articulate the patterns that we're following, even if we're not aware of them uh, in different ways. So sometimes when, uh, uh, after I list out, you know, all the tasks, one section at the bottom, I'll put like, additional notes or FAQ for all the tidbits of information that didn't fit anywhere else. You know, it's just like the pattern I've sort of uh, embraced, but um, I can see how, like, if you have a hundred writers, you're going to have documentation going in every direction and it's going to be completely hodgepodge and like a mis mishmash of different preferences, styles. You know, one person says, no, you, you should have this another, no, you should have that. So, I can see a need for this for sure to, to formalize the, the patterns that people follow for different information goals or whatever. Hey Chris, you work a fair bit with, with engineers in all the different roles you do. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that, uh, have you ever seen um, engineers successfully use templates before um, in some of the, the roles you're in? Maybe that they were already set up and they were sort of using a form of templates before. Have you ever seen not, any of them? Not really, because we've never really set them up. Mm. Um, I'm not sure how successful they would be. Maybe the only time in actual documentation perspective they've used them and followed them would be more the form of something like a blog post, but that's a mm. very kind of loose template. Or it's probably not a particularly relevant example, but it's anyone I can really think of where engineers will follow the template quite strictly is actually things like uh, GitHub issues and stuff like that. Yeah, um, that's a great example. Not really of documentation, template. but they're used to following that template. And actually a GitHub issue is an extremely loose template. You know, mm. it's just pre-filled markdown in a text box. You could do what you like with it. <laughs> but it gives them a framework, um, doesn't it? And I think that's, yeah, I think that's a key point yeah. for, pe is, for folks who are right. like yeah. starting, yeah. I guess for folks who have trouble starting to write, I think templates yeah. are like, at least there's some words on the page. Exactly. Right. And that's actually a really interesting thing to think about. It's something I never really thought about that perspective. It's actually before this call, we were talking with one about Toastmasters the, mm. the speaking and the comment I actually said was it didn't really suit me, but I did notice that following that very rigid structure really helps people who are new to it. And it's somewhat very similar, actually. Yeah. Writing and <laughs> speaking are both hard. It helps people who <laughs> don't really know how to start. They just like, well, I don't really know what to do, so I'll just follow this. Hmm. And they might struggle a little bit, but at least they're not sitting there just staring at a blank screen. Um, and it's a very good point. And I'm, I, I think I'm almost sitting in on this podcast with kind of just thinking, I'm going to do all these things <laughs> <laughs> that, that I am doing these things. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, so so Juan, I have a question for you. So, uh, like, have you ever had an experience where you had to help, like, an engineering team? Uh, contribute docs, like write their own docs, and you were you were kind of like their coach and the consultant. And if so, did you like implement these templates or send them to the Google Writing courses, or like what what was your approach for helping them write? Well, in my current role, I haven't 
coached uh, engineers or non-tech writers in writing like longer documents. I've mostly helped them contribute sections to existing documents. Mm. So I wouldn't say that's an experience that I've had, but I would definitely use the templates as a, a starting point for that. Yeah. I, I um, There's one time uh, where I specifically tried to guide a non-writer to using a template. They wanted to write a blog post for their product on our corporate blog. And I was like, oh, you know, let me give you like six sections to follow, right? Uh, like a common blog pattern. Because blogs have their own style, right? You, you can't just launch into some general topic. Like you need some relevancy hook. You know, was it a current event, something released? You know, why are you suddenly writing about this? And then mm. what, what is the news? And then, you know, explain if you can have a story structure, it's even better. You know, how did you overcome it? What obstacles? You know, so I had like this little pattern for this guy. And I was, you know, hoping that he would fill in the blanks. It was very specific section by section. He just was like lost interest altogether. I right. <laughs> never heard from him again. <laughs> I was like, okay, I guess you were really weren't that eager for, for uh, this blog post. So, but well, maybe it anyway. was too much. Maybe the template was actually <laughs> suffering from a bit of, maybe it overwhelmed the, a new writer. Yeah, I guess you're right. Like you can go too far. I mean, if a template is too specific, it can be overwhelming. Think about like the open API description. Uh, that yeah. thing is super specific and it really guides. It's almost like a form, you know, tell me the path, tell me the parameter type, tell me this, tell me that. Tell me, you know, it's like uh, pushing somebody through there. Um, and yeah, those things are a pain to, to work on. I don't know. Yeah. My main memory of giving people templates was way back in the past when I used to do more content management system work and, you know, you didn't want people just to fill in a giant WYSIWYG box and you would try and set up fields with all these sort of bits of text and people would always be like, but I want to change it. I want to move it around. I don't want that bit. I want to put that there. Why can't I just have a giant WYSIWYG? <laughs> do what I want. And uh, yeah, trying to get this middle ground was um, always fun, but um yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, Juan, do you know any place where there might be an interesting middle ground that, between giving that prompt to someone who doesn't know where to start but completely overwhelming them with so many things they feel they have to do that they equally is <laughs> equally is stumped? The first thing that comes to mind is the way uh, Wikipedia uses templates mm -hmm. and the way they have, you know, templates, especially, I think they mostly appear as little info boxes on the corner of the page for the most pertinent information for an article. And then they have common sections for related topics. And I think that's been a really successful use of templates. I didn't even realize Wikipedia had templates. So, so if you create a new Wikipedia page, is there like a structure of expected sections and everything? So the, the same way people can add any um, content for add content, they can define new templates for mm. types of data. And so, for example, for famous people and celebrities, there's probably a template type that collects their, that asks you for their date of birth and other information and then presents it on the Wikipedia page in a mm. structured manner. I, I think... Definitely, like if you can enforce a structure in content, uh, that's a that's a win. Of course, now if if you say enforce, that gets us into like did a world with XML schemas enforcing it. But I'm just mm. thinking of simple things like, uh, for example, on my on my blog, I added a field called description in the front matter. It's a Jekyll blog, and uh, this forces me to always have some kind of high level summary or overview or intro. Uh, which then gets pushed into the description tags in the HTML and is shown in the like excerpts. So if I don't do it, it kind of breaks my layout basically. Um, mm. And so uh, I don't know if like documentation can be ever be that specific beyond reference material that is highly, highly specific. But it seems like if, if you can inf enforce it somehow, um, that's like, I don't know. Of course, I now uh, hearing me say that, makes me sound like I'm a data proponent and uh, I don't want to go down that route. Like, that's, that's another level yeah. of technical writer, that one. 
yeah uh, yeah yeah you actually right. you, yeah. you do get me on something thinking there because i'm still trying to maybe understand we should go into a bit more detail about what as much as you can especially the, these google templates are um is it a guidance thing that it's you know it's suggested you follow these steps and fill in these steps on each page or is it something more rigid like a content management system type form or is, is it just more of a framework that they would like you to follow how rigid is it if you, if you don't fill it in will it break the layout like on tom's site kind of thing no it's not as rigid as what tom yeah. rigid as what tom described it's a, a style guide for each yeah. of those document types and uh, an example kind of a canonical example of a how-to and a concept that okay. you can use yeah. as a starting point okay okay so I'd imagine that in, in a template like a concept, there'd be a lot of, you can, you can use this section, but also if you need to, you can add this section in as well, or you can take it out if you don't need it. Like, can you tell us a bit more if, you, if, it's, if you're able to about the decisions in the template and when writers can actually make a call going, no, I don't need that section, but it still makes it valid from the perspective of keeping the information architecture right in all the art articles. Cause that's, I think that's the biggest value of templates. It helps you preserve um, the information architecture when people are switching between pages um, of a site. Uh, yeah, I would say we do have a lot of um, freedom and control about how we use the templates. And again, the end goal is to hopefully have a consistent experience across our site, but to at the same time serve our readers how we best think uh, we can serve them. It must have been, I really like the way this concepts page that you see here in the, um, in the, the feed sort of like has the top level um, concept and then that little short description like um, Tom was referring to that he has in his blog post because that's really great from a what's in it for me perspective. And it's like, why should I read this? You know, that's really nice. A little bit of information for the, for the people when they're looking through things, particularly concepts are sort of where a lot of new users would start, I'd imagine one. So I, I'd imagine that the way you structure a concept for something as large as cloud Splanner would, would be uh, perhaps different to um, other products that Google offer as well, or is there some consistency? I work on the cloud databases team and there is some consistency across the database products. For example, they, we, most of our products have a page on backups and on schema design. So yeah, within different areas, we have our own layers of consistency. Mm, okay, that makes sense. There's no one size fits all really for, for a product really, is there? There has to be some variance. Right. Mm, that makes sense. One analogy I'm thinking of with this whole templates thing is um, think about genre fiction. If you were going to write a romance novel or a Western novel or something, right? These are, uh, they're, they're basically formulaic, right? Or you just TV shows that we watch are also genre based formulas and there are certain expectations about it. And if I were to try to write a genre fiction, uh, being an inexperienced fiction writer who doesn't know the right way to do that, I think it would be kind of, I don't know, maybe reassuring and the first go to kind of follow a pattern and be like, okay, now my, my hero has to, you know, first of all, hate the other person. And then they have to go through a series <laughs> of, uh, you know, montages and they learn to love each other. Some, you know, some kind of like pattern. And mm. I, I, I bet if somebody's new to tech com and they're like documentation, have no idea. And you're like, no, 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 you, you got these types and these are the patterns in each. And this is a shape of documentation. It's like, it's probably super helpful. I think so many of these things are just internalized. I was, I was working on docs for some team that had written them. This was like a maps API, I think for, um, that we, we were re redoing and I was reading through the overview and I was like, uh, uh, they didn't explain the use cases for this product. It was just like, Hey, you can have a map in your tablet app 
and you create a map using this class and then this method allows you to manipulate it. And I was like, wait a minute, like we need a little more overview. What are some use cases? Like, well, give me some samples of when you would use a tablet mapping app and, you know, can we highlight any, any cool uh, examples? Like that was completely lost on them. So um, I think if, uh, you know, just as kind of um, a checkpoint for the, for the overview, for example, topic, there's certainly different patterns. Like you, you really need to have the high level. What, why should I use this? And what are some common uses? And what are some general requirements? And what's the availability? And what's the implementation? That kind of stuff. I, I mean, I think for many of us, that would just come naturally because like those are the high level questions. But somebody who's new, that might be as foreign as genre fiction formulas, right? Mm. To somebody who's not a writer, a fiction writer. Just don't mix up your templates, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, well, people have see. tried to mix. People have tried to mix up the story, the story fiction into documentation, right? People yeah. are always saying, "Oh, but you know, documentation tells a story too." And I have a hero who's my user who's you know struggling to overcome something, and then they, yeah. But you know, at the end of the day, that's very, very. That I, I really go off of a very slight tangent. The only one that really sticks <laughs> in my mind was the. Um, is it Hal's Guide to Ruby or something? It's this crazy, like, weird fiction comic book to Ruby and a wise Ruby guy, something like that. And you read it, it's just like, what the? What the? What the? What the? And it's very memorable, but I must admit, I don't think I learned anything. <laughs> it was very sticky, but you didn't learn a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder um, if we might move on to a subject of, of, so you've got all these separate sort of content types and, you know, concepts, tasks, reference, but is there, uh, like, how do you actually organize these on a site to make them right for the reader? Do you mix them? Do you keep them as separate sort of articles or uh, are templates designed to be mixed together or are they designed to be separated so that the, you know, you, you don't actually mix concerns. Let's call it that. What do you What are your thoughts about that uh, one? Do you think that there's a place for for templated content to be combined into one article, or is it really more to inform, like, to keep the structure rigid in one sort of article level type of thing? How do you find you use it? The way I think about it, or the reason I wouldn't want to mix, for example, a lot of conceptual information in a how-to guide is because I believe that would start to degrade the experience for a reader who's focused on, a, on one single task. Does that make sense? Yeah. So do you think it would sort of, it sounds like what you're saying there is that it sort of creates too much noise. Uh, in the overall sort of art information um, flow that you want to um, help the reader understand. Would that be right? Yeah, yeah. I think more than anything, these um, content types serve to uh, separate different audiences. And by separating those different audiences, you can write in a way that best serves each different audience. And maybe not audience, but... Um, audience mindset at a moment mm. okay so in the the notion of concepts do you think those that particular audience type might be for people who are learning um, foundational topics about uh, a product and perhaps um the, the task-based or procedural based contents for people who are already experienced and want to get something done is that the sort of thing you you, you mean with that or is it something subtly different i would say it's the other way around at least um, when I'm learning a new framework or programming language, I first want to um, do, for example, a hello world. I want to um, learn by, I, I mostly learn by doing. And it's only after I get stuck that I, or I've learned the basic things that I want to go into the, the deeper concepts. Okay. So you need to sort of get a win first, essentially, and then go, this is really cool. I want to learn more type of thing. Yes. And also sometimes 
it's only after you kick the tires a bit that you have the context you need to understand the the concepts, the more complicated concepts of a product. Mm, that's a really good point. Yeah, you don't know what you don't know until you don't know it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a tough part about about documentation is how to how to organize all this stuff. You know, I'm just looking at this. Mm index of the cloud spanner topics here with schemas, transactions, introspection tools, foreign keys, sessions. It's like, eh, there's often not like a specific order to a lot of the content we write. So many different parts and, and different scenarios require, you know, you to be familiar with things. And like, we don't know the path that a user is going to follow. They probably just land on it from search anyway. So they're, you know, it's not as if you can kind of scale them up from well i don't know you know sometimes once people get into it then they're like oh let me read the intro and get started and kind of warm up but maybe they just land right into data manipulation language and they're like uh you know in the thick of some deep conceptual explanation that required like a bunch of other information or they're you know uh in a task and they suddenly realize like there are all these terms these terms that maybe weren't things they knew i mean this is like why documentation is so impossible really to write uh because like you, you can't you can't proceed linearly so you try to chunk things up and make them standalone articles but even then like things don't stand alone i'm sure i couldn't understand data manipulation language without reading a bunch of these other topics right so you know it's like uh uh, I'm surprised documentation is as good as it is given all these like difficulties and challenges, to be honest. Yeah. Docs, docs is hard. <laughs> <laughs> we know this as technical writers, but it's sometimes difficult for other folks to actually understand that. Right. Uh, um, I've got an idea. Like you were asking, Go oh, ahead, sorry, Tom. I was just going to say one more thing, Jared, you were kind of, mm. uh, uh, alluding to this larger information model for documentation itself and like what is the general structure of a of a user guide and like you know mm. um, beyond the the overview and the getting started and then maybe the reference section that's separate from the tasks it seems like the information model really should just fit the topic and so mm. the, uh, the the topic can vary dramatically and, and so there is no like information model just in the same way that um, I don't know, books don't all follow the same pattern, right? It depends on the topic and, and the structure sort of proceeds from what makes sense for, for that topic, right? Yeah, well, anyway. that's right. I, mean, I think it also really depends on the, uh, each product is, is different, of course, obviously. And I think the, the one good way of working out how to structure things is think about the audience that's reading it as well and what they're trying to do. Um, so you might yeah. have a product that has a developer audience as well as a, like a front end user audience. You know, there might be two, two types of audiences. How do they want to navigate through the information that you're offering them on the docs portal? Like, um, do they want to start with like sort of would, would a, um, a typical front end user want to start first with, um, an overview of the user interface perhaps so they can orient themselves to it. You know, what sort of content type mm. is that? Is that a, a reference style or is that more conversational or conceptual information, you know? And this is where I think the, the lines do blur pretty, pretty, um, <laughs> pretty regularly when you're actually trying to work out how, what template to apply to a, a piece of content. Um, and I think as, as one alluded to earlier, it's, it's important to have flexibility uh, in these templates so that you, you get the general structure of what you need, but you still have the flexibility as a writer to tailor the content to the audience that you're writing to. So it meets that, their like needs. That. Yeah. I like that. And, and, you know, hearing you say that now makes things seem so much more sense, right? It makes a lot of more sense because you're right. If we start with the user journey and what they're trying to accomplish, like that should guide the, the way we structure the content. And then most of a lot of the docs that I write, for example, uh, people want to make their Fire TV app respond to voice phrases, right? So they have to implement something. There's a very clear structure about how to implement it. And then they have to be aware of what phrases they're going to have to support. And we have a list of them. You know, it's like 
that's not really rocket science, right? It's uh, mm -hmm. when there's a clear user journey, as you say, and you understand the user needs, you should like develop the pattern around that. Mm. Uh, so sometimes there's a lot more clear of a user journey than others, right? Yeah. Uh, and oh, tools definitely. like Cloud Spanner and these sorts of general purpose tools are the ones where it's much harder because people have a myriad of use cases. Um, yeah. Like if we uh, stop the screen share, I'll start it again. But the like if we go into something like Quick Start um, in the Cloud Spanner docs as as an exemplar, like you've got um, using Quick Start for using the console, and you know that's a that's a fairly long Quick Start. There's a lot of good detail in here that for a new user, if you follow that step by step, I particularly like the little jump out to the the settings pages. That's really nice because that closes the it closes the loop for people who are following the, the, the steps in the guide. So being able to just go, right, this is the instances page, go here, click that and you get it. That's really nice. Um, so, you know, it's, that's, that's a fair bit of stuff to work through. It's well laid out and it's step by step, but you know, there might be some people who, who depending on their experience level with cloud spanner, they might go, Ooh, that's, that's, that's pretty heavy. That's, that's a lot of ta that table of contents feels a bit overwhelming, but you don't know that until often you start getting your documentation out there and, and iterating on it until you start getting customer feedback on your documentation. So that's when templates start to evolve, right? So you've got to make sure those templates aren't set in stone and there's a way to actually collect feedback about the template design, because if a template is not working, people just don't use them. And then why are you bothering with templates? Because they no longer suit the purpose of the audience. And that particular audience for template is the person writing the content. So, you know, there's that as well. You've got to think of a way of making the templates um, fit for audience and who's actually using them. Hey, Jared, what, oh, what's sorry. the status? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris. I was going to ask a totally different question. I was actually interested to know from, from Juan, and obviously you didn't necessarily start this process, but do you have any knowledge yourself or any knowledge from people who, who were there before that changing uh, documentation to these templates has, has helped at all? Has uh, feedback been more positive? Has, it, has there been significant feedback to show that it made a difference? I mean, we often know that the, most, the biggest amount of feedback we get is no feedback at all, but... Um, <laughs> Have you, have you, has there been enough kind of significant good feedback to know it was worth doing? I, I don't know anything about metrics that were collected at the time, but I know anecdotally that we as the writers believe that the templates definitely improved our writing quality across mm. the board. Okay. Mm. Okay. I think that'd be the interesting thing to know, wouldn't it? It's like, it, it makes us feel better, but has it made the people who are reading it feel better? We, we don't know so much. It's hard, always hard to know, actually. <laughs> we hope so. I'd uh, imagine that, yeah. um, that Chris, because really when you start to use templates, they're essentially the, the backbone to information architecture, really, aren't they? When you're building a website. Mm -hmm. So it's, more, it's like trying to ask a user, uh, is the skeleton of our site useful for you? <laughs> and that's a, that's a really difficult question for a user to ask. It's almost like um, I've had some feedback uh, where I work at the moment, um, uh, which is Squeeze. And we have two doc sites at the moment, the older version of, of the matrix, um, Squeeze Matrix CMS documentation and the version I'm working on now, which is done through Antora. And a lot of the feedback I get from the older site um, is that it's, it's hard to find information that's mentioned in an article um, mm. that you're reading. And this goes down to like, there's, there's not really the, the whole idea of a lot of interlinking between to, like uh, topics or information. So that's a, I guess that's a, an example that could be rolled into a, um, uh, a template to actually explicitly say in the template guidance information, don't be afraid to cross reference or link to other information because it helps people close the loop to address the problem in 
the matrix 5.5 manuals what i've done is in matrix 6 a whole lot of like terminology was really missing from a lot of the pages there was mentioned and they were highlighted in a certain way in the document but the problem was if you were a new user you you couldn't really easily find what that term meant in context like just a quick two line summary of hey what what is an asset in matrix for example um so I used because Antor is great for X reps and cross referencing and, and linking between things. I made every glossary term a link in the content. And I sort of like mentioned it once, like with on first use, almost like you do when you're defining an acronym. And then from there on, I didn't actually link it again. Cause you know, too many links is just too much visual load in a document. So you don't want to do that too much, but just that little piece of feedback that one of the customers gave me, has changed the way I completely structure a page in the new Antora documentation to make it easier for people to actually use it. So that change is something that I want to try and measure when we actually release the product documentation soon to see if there's any improvement with um, like through Google Analytics, how people actually jump between pages, like how they go from a page with a whole lot of glossary terms on it. Do they actually jump out to those terms or do they just stick on the page and read it? sort of sequentially so it's those sort of things i'm interested in seeing what happens when we actually release a product properly i had an experience last week where talking about like how do we know if uh what we're doing makes an impact and like how do you measure it with user feedback uh i had an experience where we had field engineers uh basically come to us and say hey, we learned that this other product documentation was written by the product team and not the tech writers. And we really want it to look like the stuff Tom wrote for this other product, uh, which was much more procedural and step-by-step. -step. Like I walked them through this huge hairy process in 12 steps. Whereas this other documentation they were complaining about written by the product team wasn't step-by-step. -step. It was kind of like a bunch of different sections, no clear like task order that you would do follow. Um, and, and instead, a lot of links pointing out to other sites. It was just like, hey, read this, read that, and implement this. Uh, and, you know, just unraveling at the very core pattern that we're following, the template in our head as tech writers is step-by-step -step procedural. It's like how we simplify complexity is by taking and saying, okay, do this in the first step and then do that and then do this. You know, take, walk people through something in little micro turns until they – build the table or whatever it is they're building right and uh, mm. um like i didn't even realize that you know i didn't realize that i had this step-by-step -step model infused in my brain until they were like yeah this other docs they don't have that I'm like oh yeah you're right anyway mm. it's funny how we sort of you know, as writers we we just assume that everyone else does the writing like that <laughs> but when you actually look deeper into like even in the same organization you're in everyone does it differently often yeah. particularly if the the team they're in doesn't actually have a technical writer is almost like the the person to just just guide them down the right way like when they're sort of deviating from what they should maybe not be doing you know because i'm all for you know th there's no reason why anybody in the business shouldn't have a go at writing content if they're given the right structures and and really if they're giving templates that help them do that but i still think the, the role of a technical writer, I think I've seen certainly um, is a role of like almost mentorship in some respects where if you have a large business with a technical writing team that has no chance in actually being able to keep up with the amount of documentation that the, the product requires, then it's up to us as technical writers to actually champion the, the uh, I guess, the, the art of writing into a way that people can can actually help us out to actually help customers out to get a really great outcome. So um, if templates are the way to do that, then that's where they become really valuable um, because essentially you can force multiply yourself as a technical writer using these structures in, in the templates across the business um, and have a, just have a, almost like a, a little bit of influence always there in the template because you built it and you know that it's a good information architecture and then if other people use that structure, they're almost like having a little bit of technical writing essence into their writing when they're actually writing stuff. So that's how, I, that's why I like templates personally. Hey, hey, Jared, Jared, you brought up this good docs project that has these templates. What's the yeah. status of that? Like, I'm sure people who are listening to this are thinking, 
cool. Can you share some templates or can you send me to some actual templates? Like what, what is that, that actionable outcome for listeners here? Yeah. So the Good Dogs Project, um, we had a go, uh, we did what they call a straw man um, back in uh, uh, the Write the Docs Australia conference in 2019 for uh, the templates. And since then, um, we are sort of, we're in the sort of forming stage of the project where we want to get to the point by the end of the year where we have something that you actually show your manager um, to uh, to say, look, here, here's a pattern that we can use in our documentation um, with templates. So um, the, the current status at the moment is we've sort of broken them down into um, API um, related content there, as well as like the whole discussions, how to um, even sort of more technical template types like logging templates for if you want to have like DevOps people um, working out how to actually support something at 2 a.m. in the morning. They might want to have a template for logs so that they can, you know, understand what they're looking at and some examples. So through their bleary eyes at 2 a.m. in the morning, they can troubleshoot a problem that's causing the site to go down. Um, so we've sort of gone with that at the moment. And at the moment, the, um, the templates are very much in um, uh, an iterative phase. We've got um, issues open at the moment um, that uh, need to be worked on for the product, but also we're part of the um, season of docs uh, for 2020 this year. And um, we've uh, in the process of selecting the, uh, the people who we're going to um, get to help us out, take this vision forward um, with the project. Um, so we can actually get to the end of the year and have those templates sort of laid out really nicely and ready to go basically. So at the moment, you know, it'd be great if people listening to the episode could actually come on over and um, have a look at what we've got at the moment. And um, they're at that stage now we could actually use them, but I think there's a few rough edges in some of them that probably do need to be refined. You know, also a uh, question for Juan, I, I don't know that you'll have an answer, but it would be nice, you know, given that Google has already made these technical writing courses available and it looks like great content, you know, just uh, why not add the templates there? You know, why keep these internally? Uh, it seems like they would be extremely useful. So I, I don't know if that's a, on the roadmap or if like, you know, they're still iterating on the templates, but it'd be nice to see those there as part of that like documentation set for the engineers. Um, yeah, definitely. I agree. I know the technical writing course is kind of geared more towards like a uh, general writing and not a, not specifically mm. document um, technical I documentation. See. I see, for example, it might be something that's also useful for writing design docs or even explaining things in email. So I can kind of see why they didn't go too much into uh, document uh, documentation types and templates. But uh, I also think it'd be really cool to see that and really useful. Hmm. Well, yeah. Well, I can't believe it's been an hour already. This has been such a great discussion today. Um, I'm just wondering, before we, we do wrap up, I just want to make sure that we don't have any hanging questions or any other sort of um, comments from folks. So, I had Mike, one hanging question that mm. fed a little bit off of that. I actually, uh, how widespread uh, is this style of template? In, in Google documentation or do various teams and departments have their own templates or is it becoming a Google template? So the templates I was talking about today and that you saw in the documentation are for the um, Google cloud documentation okay. site. Uh, there are other teams that uh, aren't part of the Google, that organization, and they might have their own templates or their own process. Okay. Okay, that's good. I, that comes down to having the templates right for the product and the audience, I think, probably, Chris, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Um, yeah, I think you're right. Um, yeah. and otherwise, you're just trying to force cool. things into patterns they don't want to be in. Yeah, yeah. Your, your cookie cutter is, is far too narrow for a much broader piece of pastry that you're trying to cut out. Let's use that as an analogy. How about that? <laughs> yeah, terrible. Let's just run with it. Um, so uh, I think that probably brings us to the, the end of the show. It's been a pretty amazing um, hour talking about templates and the ins and outs of them and how you can uh, perhaps consider working them into a process at your place uh, where you work. 
um, hopefully the episode's giving you some really good takeaways um, that you can actually think about and, um, and, and work out perhaps how they fit in. Um, do come over to the, um, the Good Docs project and have a look at the templates there. And also check out the, um, the, the Cloud Spender docs because sometimes it's easy to work out um, a really good information architecture where you can see one in practice as well. And that's where it's really useful when you're trying to build out things to, to actually see something working and then go, that looks really good. I might sort of honestly steal some ideas from that and, uh, and use them and work them into my own process, particularly if you're starting out. So it was really great to actually see that one and, and get the, a bit more of a deep dive into to how the Cloud Spinner Docs works and in relation to templates. So that's been really useful today. Thank you very much. Um, so rounding out the show, of course, we'll um, show you how to get in touch with us. We've got the Write the Docs podcast um, website where you can go and access all of the previous show um, episodes. And uh, Tom is the one who goes and uh, summarizes those. So thanks for your efforts with that, Tom. Um, the, you can actually reach out, you can even subscribe um, to the, the podcast there and get updates. Um, and also um, there's a, a link here that you can use to get your feeds on Stitcher and Pocket Carts and, and Pocket Cast and also iTunes. So plenty of ways to actually get the episode delivered to you. Um, without any effort on your part. So all you need to do is sit back and relax with the coffee and uh, listen to us talk. Um, so uh, with that being said, I think that's a wrap for episode 30. And um, as usual, I'd like to thank our regular guests, Chris and Tom. Thanks again um, for coming on. Thank you. And um, you can go to sleep now, Chris. <laughs> This is yeah. super late for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, thanks again, Tom, for joining us this afternoon. And I think you meant to say Juan. Oh, yeah, no, I actually meant Tom as well. I've already, oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. I just, uh, it's the middle of my day. It's not like 1 a.m. in Berlin time. So, yeah, this is no true. problem at all. Afternoons are easy and mornings are easy for me. Look, uh, look thanks again, folks. And um, as per usual, um, remember it docks or it didn't happen. Thanks. And we'll see you next time.